We're recording. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Our uh, our Bible study this week uh, is uh, uh, a study of the lessons that are will be read uh, during the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, we have one other Sunday after Epiphany, which is the following Sunday, and that is uh, that is always. Uh, uh, the Sunday before Lent is is always the Transfiguration of our Lord, which is a uh, which is a major epiphany uh, in the uh, uh, in the beginning of the Christian uh, religion as we know it today. Um, our first reading comes from Isaiah. Again, I, I did kind of a kind of a quick run through of the. Uh, Lessons over over a, a three calendar year, um, uh, Sunday by Sunday, and we uh, we looked at Isaiah for about twenty percent of our um, of our Old Testament readings, uh, which is which is fairly significant. Uh, no other reading comes come close close to that number. When I say it's about, uh, I didn't do an exact uh, uh, recording. I just as I as I page through, I just kind of kind of kept it figure in my head for what it's worth. So it might be twenty two percent, it might be nineteen percent, but it's in there. It's about one out of every five. Um, and without further ado, um, the uh, the reading from Isaiah uh, for next Sunday is, is taken from Isaiah's fortieth chapter, verses twenty one through thirty one, and. Um, that chapter forty is a is a break off. Is is those of us that have uh, studied Isaiah, it's a uh, uh, begins with words of comfort. Uh, the first thirty nine chapters were essentially words of warning, uh, and um, it it speaks of events uh, after the exile uh, and, and tells uh, the forced coming of a uh, of a suffering servant. So would like somebody would like to read that for us? Can I read that one? I'd like to read Absolutely. that one. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Wait a second. Uh, Doug, were you going to do the colic of the day? Uh, yes. I mean, it's right here. No, thank okay. you. <laughs> I, I, was say, I, was, I was sitting here getting into Isaiah thinking, There's something else I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> and the something else that I need to do is, is the colic. Everlasting God, may give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us ancients of agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good ways may be made known to the ends of your earth in creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, <laughs> what I had to do is is. is uh, Get you a hymnal and then and then you could do the collects and you wouldn't have to remind me every single day. Then we could remind I, her. Actually, I do have a hymnal and I'd be glad to when you know if you want to trade off. Okay, since Diane's going to read the first one, which she spoke faster than I did, then I get to do the song. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That okay. Good. Carry on. Okay, from Mosea chapter forty, verses twenty-one to thirty-one. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. 
Why do you say, oh, Jacob, and speak, oh, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Mm -hmm. Powerful reading. It's a wonderful reading. I just yeah. love it. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very and, and it was uh, it was done exceptionally well, Diane. Yes, yeah, thank you. I'd love to hear you read. So why do we say, "O Jacob," and speak, "O Israel"? Because he's and asking. People are complaining, I guess, huh? Yeah. Well, so what's what's going on here? Or are you know people are they're questioning God, and uh, he and my. My study Bible does kind of just a really, you know, quick little breakdown of, of, uh, of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 35, Isaiah prophesied against the backdrop of the Assyrian threat against Judah and Jerusalem. And then verses, uh, chapters 36 and 39, he recorded Assyria's failure and warned about the future rise of Babylon. And in chapters 40, which is 40 through 66, and we're just starting that section, he wrote as if the Babylonian exile of Judah was almost over. So these people are they're they're questioning God when it said in 25, you know, when it, they say, uh, to whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. They're uh, they're comparing God to the gods of their captors, you know, the 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 uh, you know the rulers who are in control, and they're saying, well. You know their gods are obviously more powerful than you, uh, because we've been captured and we're exiled. We're down, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> and and God, and and God is countering that, and He's saying, "No, you know, look look at the power that I have. You know, remember all of this. Have you not known? Have you not heard?" And uh, you know, He's He's saying, um, even he, even when He starts talking about the stars, right? So he says, um, uh, you know, who is my equal? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the stars, the heavenly host. He, he who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Well, that was another form of worship uh, in the Middle East at that time. They, you know, they, would, they would worship the stars. Astrology. Yeah, and that's discussed a little bit. Uh, in, in another seven chapters in, in Isaiah chapter 47, I'll just read quickly that. Um, All the counsel you have received has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. So God <laughs> is there challenging, you know, challenging the astrologers and challenging his people's, you know, belief in the veracity of those those astrologers. And, and Paul, you know, one of the things when Diane asked about that in verse 27, which goes along with what you're saying, actually, my translation, ours says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Uh, my, and what my translation says, which I think kind of explains it, but it says, O Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you not heard? Have you not understood? You know, so oh, that's better. Yeah, that's more remember, understandable. Remember, Jacob's name became Israel. Right. Right. So, 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 he's yeah, talking, so, to say he Jacob is, a, is another shorthand way of saying Israel, saying the name mm -hmm. of Israel. Right. Ah. Exactly. exactly. So, so he's asking, ah. why are you saying these things? Have you not? Have you not known? Have you not heard? You know who I am and what I've done for you. 
you know, uh, and then at the end it talks about, uh, uh, what is this, something about uh, questioning his, oh, down at the bottom of 28, he says, um, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. You know, just, you're not gonna know. Why, why are you doing all this questioning? You know, you're searching yeah. out. It kind of reminds me of Job, you know, some of the things in Job. Yeah. So, um, no, that's a great, that's a great point. And, you know, when you said, when, um, he, you know, he's quoting them back to, to them, mm -hmm. uh, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. Essentially what they're saying is, you know, God, you, God, you're not taking care of us, obviously. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we mm -hmm. wouldn't be in this situation. And then he comes and he says, uh, his understanding is unsearchable. Well, what is that saying? That's saying God has a plan. He's got a plan. It's an unfolding plan. It's true, you don't understand it. You don't see the full totality of the plan. So you're complaining about, you know, your circumstances in the moment. But, you know, think about what God has done for you in the past. And I'm telling you what I'm going to be doing for you in the future. This is not the end of the story. I have a plan. And so that's what he's trying, you know, he's trying to uh, reinforce in their minds. Well, and I think- I like that. Oh, that concept of of unsearchable i like the way they describe that and you know we're searching with our bible study and and i i know that myself when i when i need answers i i you know i try to find as much of the facts as i can but in a way it's something that helps me feel as if it restores my power so me understanding the reasoning behind things makes me feel a little bit more like I'm, I'm in control or something. But then, um, so, okay, so here I am searching the Bible for answers and trying to understand God's wisdom. And then it's, it's all not really about me. I mean, I, I do tend to do that throughout my life. It's really about tr just trusting God because it's way beyond me and you know, then if I look at the big picture in the Bible, not all these little things that I'm searching for, then it gives me the faith that I need, really, mm -hmm. is depending on him versus my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and because God never gives us the full picture, right? He, he wants us to rely on him in faith. That look what mm -hmm. we do with it. If we didn't have the whole picture, well, look what we do with it. Yeah. Oh, we can't handle what we got. Judge other people. We, you know, <clears throat> think we're better and all kinds of bad stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that, yeah. that's one reason when, when I, I, I know I, I use the Lord's Prayer as uh, my daily morning prayer guide because it really is just a, a model or an outline. So when we come to your kingdom come, your will be done yeah. you know there's things that i've been praying about and it, it, it's always that reminder wait a, wait a second he, just what this says you know his the understanding is unsearchable we, we you know mm -hmm. so we have to come to that point i think his kingdom come his will be done on yeah. earth as in heaven and we have to rest in that at some point and just let go okay god you know i've laid mm -hmm. my list out I've got my prayer list here. I've laid it out. This is what I want done, you know. Yeah. And then, and then it's like, but God, your your kingdom come. Your will be done. Yeah. You know, it, it is. It's that pause to step back for me anyway and realize I I'm not in control here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 Ultimately, you have to yield to Him. Mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. you know my yeah. Bible, it says, uh, and His understanding, no one can fathom uh which right. i also yeah. i also like a lot uh, and then in, in verse 31 where it says um uh but those who wait for the lord shall renew their strength in, in my bible it says those who hope in the lord hope in the lord will yeah. renew their strength so we're talking about uh you know waiting on the lord which requires you know which gives hope and uh it requires faith and that's what he's looking for he's looking for um, faith and if you have faith you know that'll get you through these difficult times right he, he, then he goes on to that wonderful imagery but those who wait for the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint 
which is just what you know just wonderful imagery for those who are are going to approach this uh from a place of faith let me share with you what the amplified does with that last verse verse 31 mm -hmm. i don't know if any of you are familiar with the amplified but they kind of it says number th uh, verse 31 but those who wait for the lord who expect look for trust in him shall change and renew their strength and power they shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagle, eagles mount up to the sun. Mm -hmm. and, wow, yeah, I really love that. Yeah. I know the imagery of that is just like, right, you know, they're, they, they're mounting up close to God as in, eagles mount up to the sun. Wow, you know. Yeah, yeah but, it's not their wings. It's God that gives them the wings. Mm -hmm. And it's God that provides the air underneath, you know, or whatever the forces yeah. are that allow wings to work. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Those little feathers underneath those wings, yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and the blood vessels in the bones. <laughs> and then it says they shall walk and not faint or become tired. And boy, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, I, when you feel tired, you gotta go to the you gotta go to the Bible when you feel tired because yeah. that it's what's gonna lift you up. Yeah. yeah, it does. It's that peace that passes all understanding. It's and and in in a psychological framework, you know, we know that that peace gives you energy later. You know, doing meditation, doing I know I do the yoga. When I do it, I have more energy later. And it's it's like mm. our bodies need rest, and we don't often give it mental rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, we get very little of that actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we get, we constantly we get striving. all these thoughts running around in our heads and you need to, <laughs> yeah. need to calm down calm, calm yeah. down yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. In, uh, in the gospel we'll see that jesus goes out for a bit of solitude which is yes. kind of nice right. to see, so. yeah okay yeah, and that make you know makes us more aware of god's creation and and all that and god's power it's uh, it's amazing the messages that we uh, we get out of what we read. Uh, sometimes they have uh, the linkage is is, is tenacious. Mm -hmm. uh, the psalm assigned for next Sunday is Psalm 147. Uh, as you know, Psalm 150 is the last psalm in the uh, in the book of Psalms. Um, the last four psalms are, are what are known as praise psalms or, or hallelujah psalms. Um, they are uh, anonymous. Um, it's uh, pretty obvious as you read 147 that it was probably written uh, <clears throat> as the exiles were returning to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Before we get into it, um, I have a little bit to say about psalms that uh, I hope is not too confusing. And uh, this this pertains not only to the psalms, but it pertains to how the uh, how the Old Testament came into being. Uh, the psalms are basically a collection of a collection of uh, uh, of, of, of verses. It's it's a process that spanned almost a thousand years, over 10 centuries uh, that, that took the Psalms to come into place. Um, it was put together in its final form. And uh, this is kind of surprising by post-exile uh, temple personality, personality. It was actually put together in about third century BC uh, in its final form. It's divided, and we've talked about this before, it's divided into five books. Um, and those five books are meant to imitate the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which uh, was kind of surprising. Uh, Psalms that related to David don't necessarily always relate to David. Uh, they may relate to uh, 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 other members of, of David's uh, family lineage that were basically all monarchs. So uh, just because it said it was a uh, psalm of David, it may have been a psalm of, of one of his, uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, progeny, uh, sometimes a hundred or 200 years after David ruled. Um, and it was put together from a vast collection of writings. There were um, hundreds of these psalms that, that they had to, had to basically wade through to come up with something that, 
that uh, resembles what we see today. Uh, in Hebrew, Hebrew poetry, most of these psalms are, are, are poetry psalms that are to be used uh, for memory, but uh, Hebrew pro poetry lacks rhyme, it lacks uh, irregular meter. It, it's, it's not the same type of poetry that we see from, from the English poets. Uh, uh, it's most distinctive and persuasive uh, feature is of parallelism. And I really don't understand that, but uh, uh, that is the primary feature of, of, of uh, Hebrew literature. Uh, and most poetic lines are are of two and sometimes three balanced segments <coughs> in Hebrew poetry. And the balance is oft, often loose. Uh, essentially, it's a large collection of many independent pieces of many kinds serving different purposes and composed <laughs> over a course of many centuries. Uh, and when I say this resembles uh, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, uh, as we know it, was not really assembled until after the Persians released the uh, uh, people of Israel back to Israel. It was the Old Testament as we know it was put together uh, three to 400 years BC. Um, and much of it was scribed from oral tradition. And some of that oral, trad oral tradition was over a thousand years old. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, this is probably not the inspired word of God. This is probably the inspired word of God's people. Um, and and it's, it's very interesting to me that, uh, that this happened in the way that it happened. It, it kind of changes our whole concept of what really the Old Testament is. Uh, but the other hand, it does not change one iota what the message from the Old Testament is. Mm -hmm. So I thought that might be interesting to you. It was interesting to me. And uh, after all that, uh, some of which I do not understand, probably more than I want to admit, um, <laughs> if uh, Debbie would be so kind as, as to read uh, Psalms 147 for us. Sure. I, I uh, mind headings that the theme is what gives God joy. Although God created everything, his greatest joy comes from our genuine worship and trust. And as we listen to the reading of this, all these praises, let me just say, I, if I counted correctly, I, there are 17 praises in this section um, that we have here. So I, I uh, you know, mine only goes through one through 11 and I just realized it has 20 C. I what don't he is just the hallelujah at the end. At the end. Oh, good. Okay. I thought, oh, wait a second. Anyway. Or, or praise God. Hallelujah. Praise basically, God. praise God. Praise the Lord. Right. Praise right. The Lord. Oh, yeah. Right down here. Duh. Okay. I didn't see that. But anyway, I just thought this is interesting. So if we're ever at lack of um, things to praise God for, uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. My granddaughter and I are trying are telling each other things that we're thankful for each night before we go to bed. And I thought, boy, I've got a lot of things here I could tell her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Uh, Psalm 147 verses 1 through 11 and 20 C. Hallelujah. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor God with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and gathers the exiles of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord counts the number of stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our God and mighty in power. There is no limit to God's wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music upon the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth, making grass to grow upon the mountains. God provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they cry. God is not impressed by the bite of a horse and has no pleasure in the speed of a runner, but finds pleasure in those who fear the Lord, in those who await God's steadfast love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that cool? That is such a yeah, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And again, we have the con you know at the very end the concept of waiting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, oh, waiting, <laughs> waiting on the Lord, right? Um, just right. as in Isaiah. That's how we're not supposed to get uh, so far into ourselves. We're supposed mm -hmm. to wait for the Lord to let us know what's what's the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of that when Jesus was saying, I think it was Jesus who was saying in one of his sermons to, um, to focus on all the good things, you know, the blessings and all that. Remember, um, I don't know, you guys know what verse it is probably. Um, I've got it on the wall. It lists patience and faith and love and all these kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you talking about yeah. the difference? Oh, the fruits of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. Oh, yes. That's what they come. That's what kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, there's a uh, you know a uh, connection between uh, the psalm and uh, Isaiah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in verse four of the psalm, the Lord counts the number of the stars, right. calls them all by their names. And of course, we see the same thing. He in Isaiah, he who brings out their hosts and numbers them, calling them all by name. So mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's not just the Lord of the earth; he's the Lord of the heavens. He's the Lord of the skies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know the stars and all the heavenly bodies. It's like you go, astrologers. I'm the one that made the stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And of, yeah, and of course, in Isaiah, he was saying, you know what? Well, you know, why are you? You, you go, guys. Yeah, you right. go ahead you go and make the stars. <laughs> I'm the one that made them. I mean, yeah, exactly. like, like, like trying what, to, what, trying what, to. Yeah, why are you worshiping the stars? I'm the one who made them. I'm the one who right. controls them. Right? Yeah. <laughs> trying, to, trying to know somebody by just what, looking at their footprints in the mud and trying to know that person. Mm -hmm. you know, just like, this just one of the signs. Yes. It is, it is said that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, wow. If, yeah. If, if, yeah. God knows all those names. He has a great memory. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about oral history. Yeah, I don't know how do you how do you spell them all with only twenty six letters? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you, could, you, you could you could have a star named after you if you want. Yes. Oh I yeah, I did one. that for my <laughs> <laughs> I did that for my daughter <laughs> one time. Um, one of the things that's interesting though is that. Uh, <laughs> is that the zodiac was already in place at this time, and astrology was was uh, was a a, a virtually worldwide uh, uh, attempt to read sacredness into uh, into the stars and, and the constellations. So uh, the uh, uh, situation where stars are are indicated is a lot deeper than we really understand because it it goes back to uh, astrology and uh, uh, the three wise men were uh, uh, sometimes called astrologers rather than uh, seekers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it parallels it parallels Judaism. It parallels Christianity, uh, and is and it parallels most of the other religions that are functioning in the world today and it has for thousands of years it's of course the stars were there you know in the beginning mm -hmm. well you know is it is it so unfounded to think that god speaks to us through the bible maybe he does speak to other people through the stars yeah and it, you know the idea that there might be intelligent life out there in the universe uh is, is it's uh far uh it's far more impossible that we're the only ones than it is possible that we are among many. Um, and you know, that's one of the one of the things I plan to explore when I get to heaven, if if, if I'm so lucky. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a yeah. uh, we'll have a meeting right out of Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Unless, unless you get a chance to explore it before you get to heaven, who knows? Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, but there won't be wars in heaven, right? No, oh, no. no, no more tears. No more hopefully, tears. Hopefully, hopefully, that that's already been fought. No, there was one big war in heaven, but uh, that's over. That's why we're talking about demons. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You aren't supposed to say that word. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's coming up. 
<laughs> all, all I was going to say is that I'm amazed that God could come up with so many names. I mean, think of us when we try and name a child, you know, we, we struggle. <laughs> mm -hmm. God, I mean, how do, wow, I'm glad he named them. <laughs> yeah, we, we were given authority to name the animals, though. We, we yes, we, yes. yes. That's a good point. That's a good point. Mm. And the scientific names of most animals are such that I can't even pronounce them, let alone try to spell them. <laughs> yeah. Our second assigned reading is uh, again comes from Paul's uh, first letter to the uh, Corinthians, and uh, there's some uh, there's some interesting uh, interesting things in this. Uh, uh, as you read this. Uh, this this uh, message to Corinthians, you you'll find that uh, that Paul becomes the uh, uh, the epitome of a good salesman. Um, another thing that kind of uh, caught my mind, or uh, as I proclaim the gospel, and you know what we refer as to God, as the gospel, and what Paul refers to as the gospel are are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The gospels that that uh, that we identify the the four gospels and in, in the new testament were not written it yet um so he really uh, is talking about the good news mm -hmm. the good news of jesus yeah of jesus yeah would somebody books... like to, it, it's a short reading would somebody like to read it okay uh, oh okay if I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I, make, I may make the gospel free of charge. <laughs> so as not to make full use of my rights to the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The, uh, the key verse, the key sentence is, I have become all things to all people. Um, I have been involved um, primarily in agricultural uh, endeavors over my lifetime, but from time to time, uh, I, I did work in sales positions. And uh, Paul's, just nailed it. Uh, just, I mean, you have to relate to the people that you're attempting to market products to. And Paul says, I become all things to all people. Uh, to the weak, I become weak. Uh, to those under the law, I become under the law. Um, there is, a, I mean, that's, that's the key to, uh, to sales success. The other key is you have to say what you mean and mean what you say, to mm -hmm. be sure. And if you're selling a false product, uh, false product, word gets around. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously word got around and it was not a false product. So uh, uh, this could be used, uh, that this reading could be used as a, a part of a, uh, a seminar, uh, teaching people how to sell things. <laughs> Teaching how to fish for this people. Is, this this is is how to sell the gospel. Yeah. Well, you know, how to get people where they live. Well, you have to look at the end of this sentence too, though. To if you wanted to go ahead, it said, "I've become all things to all people." 
that I by all means save it. I might by all means save them. So maybe Doug would say, so that I might by all means sell them something. <laughs> well, yeah. But they, he does it for the sake of the gospel. It's like, yeah. you almost see that as being um, false, you know, or maybe you're lying to people. Maybe you're acting like, you know, you're not you, but you do it for the sake of the gospel. So. Right. The other thing that's interesting here is that uh, he's not trying to sell the gospel; he's giving it away. Right. And it's been my experience <laughs> that if you want, if you want people to have something, you're better off trying to give it to them than you are trying to sell it to them. <laughs> so, uh, but well, some people wonder it's too good to be true if it's all free. Mm -hmm. You know, right? That's no, true. The mm -hmm. uh, you know my my commentary describes this as a difficult passage and and. It is it's something that you do. You, you have Paul to kind of work through. What's that? Paul wrote it, you know, and it just goes. It just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Well, you know? also yeah. just the, uh, you know, the the way he says things and what he's trying to get across is often is often difficult to understand. But he he starts off. He says, "If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me." Okay, so he has a duty. He believes he has a duty. This is his destiny to proclaim the gospel. That's what he's there for. And then he says, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. Now, he doesn't specify what that woe might be, what he might, you know, what he has in mind. But, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, he obviously believes that he would be, you know, punished in some way where he just all of a sudden say, you know, God, I just really don't want to do this anymore. Um, and of course, he did have the experience on the road to Damascus, where uh, God deal, dealt with him uh, pretty firmly. Uh, and he, you know, that's probably a, an expectation that's in his mind. Now he's kind of doing this, he's kind of saying all this to, to uh, lay a foundation for what he's about to talk about. And then he says, for, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. So he's entrusted with a duty, but that's if it's, you know, not in his own will. So essentially what he's saying is, this is the duty that's been laid on me. I have no choice. I really have no choice in doing this. So I can't boast about it. All right. I can't boast about coming out and doing this freely, doing this, at, you know, out of my own will. This is God's will. It's a duty that's been laid on me. And therefore, I'm, you know, I'm proceeding with it. So I'm not entitled to a reward for that. I can't boast about that. Then he Paul, says, the, Paul, may what, I interrupt yeah. for a minute? May I just, part of what's going on here is some background is Paul is actually defending himself. He has been mm -hmm. accused that he is um, by others that are saying that they're they're doing the gospel better, they or whatever. Paul, he's been accused of of kind of trying to manipulate them, and he's saying to say, "No, I am not doing this. This is I have to do this." Uh, and you know, we know he was a tent maker. He did not charge people for this. Um, right. You know, so I mean, this is part of his defense. And he, to them saying, I, I, you know, if I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. It's an obligation laid on me, as you've been saying. So I, I, and anyway, I just, as part of the background of what you're saying, we need to know that this was part of why he was defending himself. Yeah, that he's, you know, that's right. That and, I, yeah. <laughs> and it, it also helps, we're we'll talking about it just a bit, to, to read kind of just uh, some of the verses that that precede this like right. you know, 13 through 15 but right. um you know he says what then is my reward right mm -hmm. he says mm -hmm. just this that in my pro proclamation i may make the gospel free of charge yeah. right so mm -hmm. as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel so what are his rights in the gospel well his his right is to actually receive pay for doing this right. to receive right. food drink shelter uh, and, you know, and so on for, and pay for actually doing this. So in, in 13, he says, don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel 
should receive their living from mm -hmm. the gospel. And so what he's saying is, I'm entitled to this. These are my rights, but I'm not asking for it. So even though I can't, you know, I can't boast uh, for, uh, I can't boast about proclaiming the gospel. That's my duty. But I can boast about doing it for free. <laughs> and that, that's, that's essentially, that, that's essentially what, what it comes down to. That's what he's saying in that last, that last right. sentence. He says, you know, just what is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge. So it's not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. So I'm not going to insist on them. So I'm going to, bur I'm going to boast about that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he does, you know, and he does. And you're right, uh, Peggy, this is in defense of them, you know, coming after him. Uh, for mm -hmm. these things and he's saying look i'm entitled to this but i'm not asking for it all right not like the other guy the other guys were, were the asking other guys were yeah. asking for money yeah right, right. right. exactly and their rights and he's saying and that's why when we go on which you're going to when we go in through 19 through the and through 23 this is his method of ministry you know as as doug was saying you know he, he becomes all things to all people so that i might save some you know he's doing yeah. this i don't mean to preempt you but yeah yeah, yeah no the, yeah no the, that, that's great and i i just you know he says he kind of goes through it this is paul the chameleon but in a good <laughs> but in a good way right and he, he, he said he said to the jews i became as a jew in order to win the jews all right and mm -hmm. so what he's saying is you know, he, he's not going to unnecessarily antagonize the Jewish people, even though he understands that he's not, he, he doesn't have to follow the same rules that they do. When he's in this, their presence, he's going to respect their rules and customs and do as they do, right? He's not, you know, and, and of course, uh, most of the early Christians were Jews. So there was no point in antagonizing that, you know, that segment of the population. He wasn't going to do it. He talks about to those under the law, I've become as one under the law. And so again, he's talking about Jews there, but he makes it, but he says, though I myself am not under the law. Okay, so that I might win those under the law. And then he says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. And he's not talking about outlaws when he says outside the law, he's talking about Gentiles, those mm -hmm. people who aren't, you know, who aren't under the law. Then he says, though I am free, I am not free from God's law, but I, am, uh, but I am under Christ's law. So it's kind of a distinction there between, he says, I am not under the law, which is all the rules and everything that the Pharisees and teachers of the law have created, but I am under God's law, all right? So what, you know, what God wants me to do, I must obey. And of course, I'm under Christ's law. Uh, and then he says, to the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the week. And we talked about that last week, right? Where he was just talking about, you know, those who were concerned about food sacrifice to idols and, you know, did it really mm -hmm. matter. And he said, well, okay, yes, they're, they're weak in this regard, but I'm not going to push the point, right? Uh, because, you know, I, I, you know, I want them to continue on their path and they'll learn and, and, you know, they will be saved. So in that way, he says, I've become all things to all people. And it, that, um, that I might, by all means, I mean, any way possible, I'll save some. Save them. And here he's under, he, he's under no illusion that he's going to save everybody. He right. says, save some. <laughs> and, you know, and, and he, he understands that. And then here in 23, he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. And here he shifts from from the collective which is is his main concern saving as many people as possible but he's also mindful of his own needs right so that mm -hmm. he may share in its blessings mm -hmm. so it's a recognition that in doing this he's also getting something very important out of this whole process and he you know and he is here mindful of his own needs although he doesn't talk about his own needs very often it's almost always about you know others mm -hmm. No. Only, this when sounds, asked, okay. only when he asks for prayers, but this, this last sentence kind of, he's gone on, you know, about all these things that he's doing, you know, as, as, as I said, the method of his ministry. And then uh, it, it, you kind of see the more, the more vulnerable side of him, 
so that I might share in its blessings. Yeah. You know, it's like, like like the air goes out of the balloon. You know, he's getting this across, and that's like, ah, oh, yeah. I'm doing well, this. Yeah. And it's kind of a it's kind of a tender statement. I, it and, is. And, yeah. and I, I I really do like that he that he did it. Mm -hmm. it's humble it reminds me of jesus teachings when jesus said that he was there to be a servant you know mm -hmm. he's he he didn't place himself above people i mean people declared him king and stuff even when they asked him are you king he said well you say i am right even when he was being tried and it's right for his crucifixion that he sat down with sinners and he ate with you know unclean and and it was like an example and here Paul is following his example and it's the power of persuasion. And it's the way people need to communicate nowadays, you know, with all our differences. We don't want to just stay holed up in our camps. We want to, you know, <laughs> acknowledge communication and the common, how we feel in common with other people. And that's mm -hmm. a better way to reach people. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, we, we persuade them and they persuade us and we work it out. Yep. Yep. And our gospel reading, um, uh, as, as we realize, uh, with uh, year B of the liturgical calendar comes from, uh, from Mark's gospel. Um, the reading comes from Mark, first, uh, first chapter of Mark, uh, verses 29 through 39, and it's a, it's a direct communication or direct linkage to uh, where, uh, where the gospel reading uh, 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 quit last Sunday, if you will, uh, with news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. And uh, Jesus, uh, with uh, James and John, entered the house of Simon and Andrew. And I'm wondering if somebody can read that for us. I can read that. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Well, as I'm reading through this, um, come to the point where, and she began to serve them. Mm -hmm. And the note I made was, what? <laughs> did, he, did he heal her? Did he heal her so she could get out of bed and and, and serve them? It's yeah. not a <laughs> well. That yeah, that's also often kind of a a, a controversial um, uh, verse. Uh, they, they were they were coming from. Remember, they were coming from the synagogue. That was where Jesus had healed the uh, demon possessed man, and they were they were coming um, to the house of Simon and Andrew for the Sabbath meal. That's what they did, you know, after after the synagogue, and so they would have. You know, a, a Sabbath meal, and then, of course, at, at sunset, and you know, then uh, the Sabbath would be would be over, which is when people started coming out. I, you know, uh, uh, that is that is kind of a controversial statement. The way I kind of look at it is, um, uh, obviously, he wanted, you know, he wanted to heal her, but I've often kind of wondered if uh, if uh, when Jesus heals you. Not only are you healed of whatever malady it was he healed you of, but maybe you you feel better than you ever have in your entire life at that moment, right? Maybe maybe in addition you're filled with tons of energy and you just really feel like 
doing things. <laughs> so that, you know, and I don't know. But I think she also saw, you know, this, this was her role in life. She, you know, she was the keeper of the household. She took care of the family. You know, she was the one who, who typically prepared the Sabbath meal. She was the one who was in charge of all of this. And so yeah. this was her, this was her thing. And so I, you know, that, that's how I kind of look at it. But she also may have gotten some, you know, some kind of a burst of energy from this, from this. Well, and the other thing is everybody, we, we, we read this with Western eyes. Yeah. And we're reading it with 21st century Western eyes or 20th century. Yeah. This is an Eastern culture. This was not, this was a patriarch society. Yeah. This was not something men did. So, you know, we have to be careful when we read a lot of these things that we're looking at it with our Western eyes. And that's, and especially the, the time frame of this, you know, and, and even I think uh, today, this is still, this type of society is still very prevalent. In the Middle East, you know, oh, yeah. so, and in other parts of the world. Yeah. In other parts. Yeah. So, Where is it that I've heard of when Jesus healed people, they got up into action? Um, it's and it's like a simile for when we're saved, we're called to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time he healed somebody, they got up and walked, or they got up and did this, or they got up and did that. And yeah. it's it's telling us that we need to get up and do. Yeah. It's like they have a second chance, their life is renewed, and now yeah. it's time to give back, kind of to try to give back for what you've gained. Right. I think Paul makes a good point, though, too, uh, is that when someone was healed by Jesus like that, the fact that they must have felt better than they'd ever felt in their entire life. Uh -huh. You know, it just yeah. that, because when you're healed, it's not just kind of <clears throat> a little thing, you know, it's healed. Yeah. It's a big yeah, deal. Yeah. yeah. And this was, you know, I think when Je when Jesus healed you of something, it was a complete healing. Correct. I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't lingering. Yeah, okay, here we'll give you something and in a few days you'll start to feel better. You know, <laughs> it, 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 that, that wasn't what it was, right? Well, that's why it they was a jumped, miracle. Yeah. yeah. They jumped up and grabbed their bed or whatever. It was like, woohoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Hey, there are begging. instances in the gospel where that where that happens. Yeah. Right. So, um, may, may I read you this thing about that, that I wanted to share about the, the thing about the D word? Yeah. There. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's too. I, th I think it's too late to do that. We've already. <laughs> this, this is. I thought this is. Why didn't Jesus want the demons to reveal who he was? Yeah. By commanding the demons to remain silent, Jesus proved his authority and power over them. Right. Jesus yeah. wanted the people to believe he was the Messiah because of what he said and did, not because of the demon's words. Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted to reveal his identity as the Messiah according to his timetable, not according to Satan's timetable. Mm -hmm. Satan wanted people to follow Jesus around for what they could get out of him, not because he was the son of God who could truly set them free from sin's guilt and power. Yes, and I yeah. thought, wow, that is such a good explanation. Even for last mm -hmm. Sunday, um, you know, I, I, I just thought this is that explains because I always wonder why did he keep him quiet? You know, but didn't he want it announced? Mm -hmm. But he didn't want he was he didn't want he's, them he's, announcing it. Yeah, I just yeah, thought, yeah. And in other words, yeah, he he wanted it to be God's agenda, right? And not the agenda of, of Satan and, and, right. and show his authority over them. And, right. Yeah, and and I think the other, you know, he he was not ready to declare himself. Right, and he wanted he wanted the people people to start to get to know him by his words, by his preaching, and by his healing and by his miracles before. And he and he wanted that to be kind of clear and widespread before he announced himself as the Messiah. Because if you if you flipped it around and he said and he came and declared himself as the Messiah first before doing any of those things, people would have said, well, "What are you talking about? Who are you? Get out of here!" Yeah. Right. So and. Um, <laughs> You know, it just, it, it just from a practical standpoint, it, it makes yeah. perfect, he knew perfect how sense best to start to, help. to build his reputation mm -hmm. before he actually declares himself, right? Well, and that's the way I, he communicated with people, you know, like, like Paul was saying, I got down on their level and that way they understood me from the get-go. It, it helps to make a deeper roots. Mm -hmm. The roots mm -hmm. are more sound instead of some flighty idea of 
you know, a little too high and mighty. Right. Well, you know, this is exactly, I think, in, in another way, what we're doing, going through these lessons every week, we're getting to know Jesus, and, you know, and God the Father and the Holy Spirit better because and having a deeper relationship rather than when we first became Christians, you know, when we were first baptized, you know, that was, it's, it's just like, yeah, we, we have a, such a much more um, a comprehensive knowledge, but we also have a deeper knowledge. And a, I think, you know, a closer walk with God because of just because we take the time for this, I think. Yeah. Anyway, Peggy, you really makes, hit. Yeah. You Go really ahead. hit the nail on the head there. Um, one of the, uh, I, I mean, this is what the lessons are all about. They're lessons. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're teaching tools. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in, in the liturgical services uh, throughout the world, uh, the lessons are tossed about. Uh, you know, most mm -hmm. people, as they exit the church, can't even remember what they were. Or how they related to each other. Yeah. Or, or, or how they or how they strayed. Well, yeah, I used to get something out of it when I heard it right then, but this way we're contemplating it for many, you know, over and over throughout the week and things like that. Yeah. Helps it sink in. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm glad you got something out of it when it was read. I'll tell you, there's times when it's been read and I'm. It's just gone. I mean, as much as I, I you know, I couldn't. I have to look back at the bulletin to tell you what the scriptures were. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not a that's, quick thinker. No, yeah. no. That, that's very I, typical. And it's, it's, it's the reason that I see this is, is, is one of the more useful uh, functions that we who, who, who attend liturgical services can, can absolutely do. Uh, you, come, you come into there with, a, uh, with, a, with an understanding of what, of what mm -hmm. has taken place. And you walk out of there, particularly if the if if the preacher uh, uh, delivers a homily mm -hmm. around the lessons, uh, that basically reinforces what you know. And uh, um, unfortunately, that's that doesn't happen as much anymore as it should. But mm -hmm. it is what it is. This, this so, is like uh, a Sunday school for adults. Uh, now, my grandmother, mm -hmm. as an older woman, used to go to Sunday school before church. So they had adult Sunday school. Yeah, that's we a good idea, one right one before church. church. Yeah. And so this is mm -hmm. kind of like what that was. I'm sure it was like yeah. talking about the lessons and stuff like that before you go to church, which is a great idea. Yeah. I think. Yeah, really good. Now, a lot you. of people don't want to come to Sunday school and go to church too. So that's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, if I could just go over a few few more things. Um, so, you know, in 32, it says that evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed. So they can't, you know, during, during the Sabbath, they're not allowed to carry anything and they can't travel more than two thirds of a mile, right? right? So they're restricted, but it says at sunset, they brought to him. That shows how eager they were, okay? They saw Jesus heal this, this demon possessed man <laughs> and they're, they're already on the move as soon as they can. They're, they're on the move towards, towards where mm -hmm. Jesus is, right? And then it says, and the whole city was gathered around the door. Uh, it's estimated that Capernaum had about uh, 1,500 people um, at that time. So there were 1,500 people around the door <laughs> or out, mm -hmm. around, out around the house. Okay. So and sick people. Yeah. And he cast out many demons. And then, of course, we went through this. He would not permit the demons to speak. And mm -hmm. then in the, uh, in the morning, okay, and then in, in Luke's version of this, it says at daybreak. This is, here it says, in the morning, while it's still very dark, got up and went out to his deserted place, and there he prayed, okay? So mm -hmm. he has some time alone. He has some time alone with the Father. And he's essentially, as you find out a little bit later, he's getting his next, next set of instructions, Okay, where, what, am I, what am I to do now? What he conveys to them at the end of this. But I find it really interesting. Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. <laughs> now, do you think that there was my, like maybe a little bit of guilt being laid uh, you know, <laughs> on him mm -hmm. through, 
Where'd you go? Street. Who's this guy? Where'd he go? What are you doing? Why did, you know, so he gets up he's, and apparently, you know, he's up before anybody else. Apparently he doesn't leave a note. He doesn't tell anybody where he's going. He just goes, right? Because so. yeah. And, and he said, everyone is searching for you. Now in Luke, it's when they say here, here, talk about Simon and his pan, companions going out and hunting for, for him. In Luke, it's it, when he says everyone, it really means everyone. It wasn't just it wasn't just the disciples who were searching for him. A lot of the other people were out there looking for him too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now what I love about this is he answered. And so how does he answer? He doesn't explain himself. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't, you know, this is just, he just, all he says is let's go on to the neighboring town. So, so that I may proclaim the message there also for that is what I came out to do. It, it is such an alpha move on his part. It, you know, just like, I don't have to explain myself to you. I'm not going to apologize. I did this. Now let's move on. And of course, <laughs> just mints the words. Yeah. So this is, yeah. Which I, you know, and um, <laughs> I love the alpha move. I, that, that, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, he, he's the leader, right? And he's just saying, I don't have to answer to you. This is what we're going to do now. And of course, these were the instructions that he had just received from the father that they spent enough time in Capernaum. They had done, you know, obviously there were still more people who could be healed and so on and so forth, but they really needed to move on and go on to the other town to start preaching the gospel there too. My, my study notes said in Galilee, there were about 250 towns. So just at that time. So that, just that, even though it was so divided up to what, Judea, Samaria, and, and Galilee, but just Galilee alone. Had, of course, you know, a lot of them were not huge like we think of no. huge towns. You know. So, how was Jesus teaching um, in those situations? He was healing, doing miracles, so that people started really paying attention to him. But was he teaching? See, he he hadn't even told his disciples that he was going to be crucified and that he'd be rising after being crucified, and that he was the key to eternal life at that point right he had been baptized so was he teaching repentance kind of the story you know the the message that john had been teaching no 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 uh -uh. no john taught repentance this was you know turning back to god listening and and coming in to a, a relationship you know he was he was at, preaching at, at this point oh. in his at this point in his ministry um he had not revealed uh, the uh, the final chapter yet uh, to the disciples. That actually happened in the third uh, to uh, a a much greater degree in the third year of his ministry. This this represents the first year of his ministry. Uh, just as he just as he's calling his disciples, uh, they have no idea at this point what they're facing. Uh, and uh, for sure, uh, he didn't want them to know at this point. Uh, if, if I was told if I met a fellow on the street, he says, follow me and I'll make sure that you're crucified upside down someday. Uh, you really don't want to follow him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like, to answer Diane's question too, think back in the gospels, Jesus, when you're asking what was he, he was telling people the kingdom of God is like, Remember through all those, actually Stephen did a series on that. The kingdom of God is like, and this is what Jesus was telling them at this point. That's he was why showing, he, them. Showing, right, them. He was showing them. That the Beatitudes, you know, uh, he would tell, was telling them. Yes, all of those, there's, there were seven sermons or teachings, uh, that, as I recall, that Stephen preached through that the kingdom of God is like. And I, mm -hmm. I to me, I gotta that, go back and look at that. Yeah, yeah and a lot of it, particularly like in the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, in the Beatitudes, and he's, he's talking, telling the people how much God cares for them. Right, um, right. There is, there is some message of repentance in, in, in the things right. that Jesus says. He does, he does hit on those points, but his, his whole message is much more about God's care for his people. Mm -hmm. And of Love. course, yeah, and his God's love and his care and how he's taking care of you. You know, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, drink, you know, all, all these things that he's expressing because God, you know, God has a deep love for you. And, um, and eventually he does start to reveal these things, particularly his disciples, but he reveals things to people 
as they're ready to receive them. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, he builds them up as their understanding grew, you know, at a certain point when he believed that they were ready to receive some of these things, you know, he, he told them. And even then it was really difficult for them. Then. There was a lot of pushback. So. Um, I've, I've got to butt in for a moment. I'm, it's uh, 1128 and I'm about to leave. Okay. Um, if, if you follow the liturgical calendar, there are a possibility of three more Sundays of Epiphany, but because Easter has moved forward uh, about uh, uh, in coming early, uh, the, next, uh, the next Sunday of Epiphany, which is the last Sunday, uh, is the Transfiguration of our Lord. So uh, we're going to skip about, about uh, uh, three Sundays and go right into the uh, Transformation. Uh, transfiguration. transfiguration, excuse me, transfiguration. Um, and Peggy, if you want to read the collect, uh, I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, oh, really? Okay. So. I, anyway, yeah. um, I'm leaving. Um, thank you all again. Hi, right, thank you, Doug. Okay. Thank you. Very thank good, you. Doug. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we're, we're kind of about to wrap it up anyway. We still on our Dougisms, though. <laughs> If I do the calling, he still has to give us his duckisms. <laughs> He's gone. Okay. Yeah, I think I think he might have. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Know. yeah, I'm getting. I'm so getting a does do, do people here? Do you all think like God is revealing Himself to us, little by little, kind of too, like 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 Jesus was doing with the people there? Oh, yes, definitely. I think it, it definitely is a process. I mean, it, it, you know, through prayer and study of the scriptures and involving yourself. And more, so, more so with stuff like this, we're studying yeah. and we're getting more and he's revealing more to us because we're actually actively studying the yeah. word. Too, you know? And I think that's what a lot of people, uh, you'll get a lot more out of it if you do some study. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And talk about it. I think what happens too is if we don't talk about it, you know, we can't ask yeah. questions, we can't share, you know, um, and learn from yeah. each other. I, uh, to me, yeah, right. yeah, it's easy if you're just uh, uh, studying on your own, and of course, you, you can learn a great deal doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you can get stuck, uh, you know, in a certain mindset, a certain way of thinking about things, and. It's really good yep. to get a fresh perspective mm-hmm. from other people. Yeah. Okay. 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 So is that about, is that it? I think we that, are, that pretty much it. it. All right. Very good. Well, let me, let me go ahead and say the Lord's prayer. Yeah. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. 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 Hey, wonderful guys. Thank you so much. You have a great great week. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.